All right, we're, we're switching gears. We're still in this second level of the complexity bullseye, finite state machines, CFLs. And now we're going to talk about the equivalent machine version to context-free grammars. And they are non-deterministic pushdown machines. And I'm going to tell you just what they are. We're going to do examples. We're going to try to distinguish between what they can do and what deterministic pushdown machines can do. And we'll talk about the structure and the applications of all these things today. OK, questions? Everybody all right? So again, we're gonna, you guys are going to be involved in about one minute. A pushdown machine is just like a finite state machine, except we put in an extra piece of power. We put in a stack. And the finite state machine, instead of just being able to move from state to state, can also, every time it sees a symbol, manipulate the stack in the way that you're used to. It can push a symbol on the stack and or pop a symbol off the stack. Right? So every single step it moves, it moves a state, and then it also manipulates the stack. Right? That's it. That's what it can do. So if you want to make a picture of such a thing, just a little abstract picture, and then you can put it on some textbook that you write, instead of that Leonardo da Vinci thing. Uh, the finite state machine would be here. Here's the input where every cell holds another symbol. And this arrow represents that the finite state machine is always looking at some particular cell. And it always moves uniformly left to right, step by step. It doesn't have the power to go back and forth. I mentioned that a finite state machine that does have the power to go back and forth, that actually doesn't give you any more power. In this version, we're sticking with the unidirectional movement and uniform movement of the uh, machine. But I should mention that if you do allow two-way movement on a pushdown machine with a stack, then you can do more things than you can without the two-way movement. So in this case, we have to be careful to just imagine that we're moving left to right. and We can't go back and look again. OK, finite state machines, it doesn't help. But here, it would help. OK, now, not only can this finite state machine look and read input, but it also manipulates a stack, which we'll keep here. And we'll make a little bit bigger just to distinguish it from the input tape. And the stack has symbols in it. And that's the top. So it can pull things off and put things in. And that's what this machine looks like abstractly. When we're going to write a program to do machines like this, we are not going to write it the way that, that, that you see it in some books is they just actually list the transition function. And it's, it's quite mathematical looking and not so intuitive. We're just going to expand on the notation we use for finite state machines and add in the stack manipulations in that notation. So it looks very much like what you've been doing up till now, except with extra things on the arrows. If you define it formally, it's the same five tuple that a finite state machine was, but there's an extra two things. So it ends up being a seven tuple. The extra two things, or an extra one thing, I suppose, the extra one thing is the stack alphabet, because you need to decide what kind of symbols you're putting in the stack. And the transition function is no longer as simple as it was, just going from a state and a symbol to a state. Now it goes from a state and a symbol and the top of a stack and a stack symbol to a state and a stack symbol. So everything's a little more complicated formally, but intuitively it won't be so bad. So let's start with some specifics. Let's take a language that we know is not a finite state that has no finite state machine, that's not regular. And let's try to build a pushdown machine for it. Let's first do it intuitively to make sure we know how we could use the stack to help us here. And then we'll actually write the machine out so you'll see your first machine. So who's got an idea? How do you accept things like this? You only have a finite number of states. And depending on what state you're in, you're allowed to manipulate the stack depending on what symbol you see. So let's think of an idea before we write it out. OK, so read a zero. Read the, read the thing left to right. If you see a zero, we'll push something on the stack. Say an x will be for a zero. Right? So we, we're putting x's on the stack. And then when we see a 1, we just start popping things off the stack. And if we hit the empty string, or when we hit the end of the, the, the string, the same time the stack is empty, then we know that it's OK. And if we hit anything else along the way, we just die. So like if the stack runs out and we try to pop, that's just the end? That's a crash, right. That's a non-accepting computation, right. Or if there's no arrow defined, you know, if there's a symbol on the stack that, you, that 
doesn't say what to do with it, that's a crash. The same, pretty much the same as before. If there's an error that isn't defined, it's a crash and, and it's not accepted. So let's write a machine that does it. Here's how we'll do it. We have a start state just as we did before. And we'll indicate semantics of these states. So this will be the push state. This is the state that we're hoping to see zeros. And we're going to push things on the stack when we do. All right, so let's write it out. If we see a zero, we stay in the state and we keep pushing. If we see a zero, we stay in the state. But there's more that needs to be on that arrow. We have to say what was on the stack before and what we want the stack to look like now. So this is a matter of notation. And this is my own notation, which is kind of the way a lot of books do it nowadays. It wasn't the way people did it 10 years ago. And I don't know if our book does it precisely the way I do it, but it's close enough. What I like to do is I like to write the top of what's on the stack currently as the next symbol. Right now, the stack we imagine would be empty. And I think of z as the empty stack. You can check if the stack's empty. z is the, the bottom symbol in the stack. So if the stack is empty, then we're going to put an x on it. And I write that like this, xz. So this kind of notation is a push. I'm pushing something on, on the left of, of the empty stack. OK? Yeah, Doug? Um, in the finite state machines, a lot of times we would have like 0, 1 to mean that it was an arrow for 0. Oh, yes. Right. Is it just contextual if you know that you're in push time machines, you know to interpret it this N way? No, I think that that notation I use, 0, comma, is really bad if I intend to do this later. Okay. I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't do it. I should use plus instead of comma, because I mean plus anyway. It's just that in mathematics, plus in this kind of theory area is always, always means union. And comma usually means union in math if you put curly brackets around it. So it's often used instead. But I should have been careful there and just wrote plus instead of comma, because these commas are different. These commas mean three separate things. Zero combined with the empty stack, push on the empty stack, and then go back to where you were. Yeah. Yeah, this is the symbol you're reading. This is what the top of the stack looks like now. That's what the top of the stack looks like when you're done. Um, so XZ. Z is a stack? Z, Z is a symbol that sits on the bottom of the stack. Okay. It's the empty stack. But so what happens the when, second time yeah. through? So I've, I've, I've done that once. I've, I have XZ. Now I get another 0. You can't use this transition the second time through because oh. there's an X on the top of the stack. Okay. Michael's right. I mean, if I just have this machine right now, it can't do any more pushing. It can only do one push. Mm -hmm. You're right. And I'd be dead, and I wouldn't accept anything. Well, I don't got any final states. I'm not accepting anything anyway yet. But, but you're right. That's a problem. We have to add in another transition. So I'll put it up here. 0 z x z 0 x x x. So if you see an empty stack, or you see an x, and there's a 0 as your symbol, push an x on the stack. This just means push an x on the stack if you see a 0. Sometimes, you see how I have two things here? Sometimes, if you just want it to mean this, you would write this. 0, anything, x, anything. Okay, whatever's on the stack, if you see a 0, stick an x on top of it. That's all this really means. I'm just being formal here, and I'm writing down all the possibilities. The only symbols in our stack are going to be x and z, the empty stack. There's always z. That's the empty. The, the thing in the middle, is, is it just it's whatever's at the top of the stack. Do we look down multiple layers into the stack? The All you can see is the top. The top. Okay. Yes. It's a stack, right? It's a real stack, <laughs> like those plates in the cafeteria thing. Huh? All right. So I'm reading the zeros. I'm reading the zeros. If I ever read a one here, what happens? I need to go to a different state because I have to remember that now I'm in a popping mode. If I stay in the same state, I'd be able to push zeros on again, and I don't want to be able to do that. So if I see a 1, I pop. Sorry. If I see a 1 uh, x, I pop. Here's how we write pop. We write the top of the stack like we do before, but here we say pop. OK? Sometimes books put an empty string there or something. But that confuses me, because I always think of the empty string as being a, an input symbol, not, I just like to write pop. It's clear enough. And now we go to another state, which we'll call the pop state, because this is a state that we're doing popping from. And in this state, what should the transition be? We want to look for only ones here. And one, one x 